Okay, so another example, this one actually have seen before when we started a uh, discussion about the uh, systems. This was an example that I used when I showed you the null lines and the equilibrium points. So take a look uh, at the first lesson uh, to see how we can find the equilibrium points. In this case, are 0, 4 and 4, 0. It's not, it's not that hard, just make a substitution from the first equation. But again, we have two equilibrium points, and at that time, um, we infer the stability of that point just based on the on the plotter. So let's see how we can do this mathematically with the, uh, with Jacobian, right? So uh, as before, we're going to set up the Jacobian matrix. <coughs> so the partial derivatives are constants for the first one, right? So partial x is minus 1, um, and then uh, partial y is minus 1 again, right? So the first equation. Partial x of the second one is 2x partial y of the second uh, function is 2y. So very simple uh, Jacobian matrix. Again, carefully replace uh, each coordinate with the coordinates of the equilibrium point. So x0, y4, we're, we're testing this equilibrium point now. Now obviously the first row doesn't change because it's a constant. Here we plug in 0 for x and for for y. <coughs> okay, so we have minus one, minus one, and zero and h on the second row. By the way, with linear algebra, um, if you remember how to find eigenvalues with the what you learn from linear algebra, you could do it faster here because this is a diagonal matrix, and you could tell the eigenvalues are minus one and eight. I'm going to just go over the full. Um, uh, recipe of finding the eigenvalues. We're not going to get into other details related to that because there are some techniques, some shortcut techniques in which you could actually figure out the sign of the eigenvalues, whether they're positive or negative, uh, without actually finding them. But I don't want to go into that. We may, I may add uh, some of that later as an addendum to this to this class. So for now, just find the eigenvalues and use the linear classification uh, to figure out the stability. The trace is minus uh, is seven, so that's going to be lambda square minus seven lambda, um, and the determinant is minus eight. So notice this factors into lambda minus eight, lambda plus one, and obviously one eigenvalue is eight, like I said, the other one is minus one, um, and so therefore we have a saddle point. And moving on, the second equilibrium point for zero. Going back to the Jacobian matrix now. Again, first row is the same. Two times four, and then two times zero. So the Jacobian at the second equilibrium point is minus one, minus one, and eight and zero. What about the characteristic equation? The trace is minus 1, so that's lambda squared um, plus lambda plus 8, 0 minus negative 8. And using the quadratic formula, that's minus 1 plus minus square root of 1 minus 4 times 8, which is 32, divided by 2. And that means lambda is minus one half plus minus i root 31 over 2. So you are in the complex case with a negative real part. What does the classification handout says? In that case, the point is a stable or attracting spiral. By the way, in many modeling problems, you don't actually care about whether it's a spiral or a nod. So, I mean, if you only care about asymptotic stability, again, the, there are techniques which bypass finding lambda, which, by the way, if you, if you look at math biology papers, like in my area of research, that's a blessing because in many models, it's extremely, extremely tedious to actually find the eigenvalues. So, it, we're, we are actually fortunate that there are techniques that bypass finding lambda and only tell you whether lambda is either negative or with negative real parts. So, again, if you don't actually care about how it approaches the equilibrium point via spiral or via node. If you don't care about any of that, 
then you can look at all the cases of negative eigenvalues or a negative real part and then put them all together into the asymptotically stable category because there are techniques of finding uh, the sign of um, real part or the lambda if it's real uh, bypassing actually finding lambda. Even that can be tedious actually in, in the real life models but um, usually finding finding lambda in practice it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not the way to go. And again uh, maybe later on I, I don't know exactly when I may add some of this stuff. In fact, I'm gonna uh, finish the class with a little conclusion video to give you some ideas of what I would like to, to do on top of this um, um, basic introductory course on differential equations. So this is a stable spiral. And let's finish the section with uh, the case I mentioned before, the borderline case in which um, the linearization doesn't apply when it's not applicable. So this was the second example, right? So let's let's do a third one. <coughs> um, these examples actually are cleverly concocted so that they will have the behavior that you're looking for. And I'll actually mention some of that at the end, which is optional. Um, you know, the way you actually figure out, in fact, in this case, how the uh, solution looks like. But let me emphasize how um, that's not optional, by the way. So let's, the fact that you have to recognize when the linearization is not applicable, that's not optional. That's part of the, of the course. So make sure you are aware when Jacobian method doesn't work. So let's just do that first. So suppose x prime is y minus x times x squared plus y squared. And actually, I'm going to write it without parentheses as well for the purpose of differentiation, because that's easier. Uh, and the second equation is minus x uh, minus y quantity x squared plus y squared. And again, without parentheses, that's minus x minus x squared y and minus y third. And let's look at the zero, zero equilibrium point. It's obviously that zero, zero is an equilibrium. Actually, I don't know if there are other. I don't think so. I remember correctly the picture, but zero, zero for sure is an equilibrium point. So let's say you want to use the Jacobian method to find its stability. <coughs> All right, so let's look at the Jacobian matrix, J of x, y. And if you want, just for practice, pause me and do the partial derivatives. I strongly encourage you to do actually that, to make sure you can do the partial derivatives correctly, because you're going to have that in the final. Uh, and then check with me. <coughs> so partial x is minus 3x squared minus y squared. And then partial y is 1 uh, minus 2xy. Moving on, partial x of the second equation is minus 1 minus 2xy. And that's it. And then partial y is minus x squared uh, minus 3y squared. All right, so that's the Jacobian in X and Y. Let's continue over here. Um, what is J of zero, zero? Because now we plug in the equilibrium point. Well, J of zero, zero is just zero, one, minus one, zero. Okay, so that's the matrix, the Jacobian at zero, zero, at the equilibrium point. But notice what happens if I solve for lambda. The trace is zero. That's the dead giveaway of a borderline case. Um, well, the whole equation is a dead giveaway. But let's see. So lambda squared is, um, so the trace is zero. Lambda squared minus the trace times lambda. The trace is zero. And then the determinant is zero minus negative one equals zero. So the positive determinant, the trace equal to zero, you are in a borderline case when the linearization doesn't work. Why doesn't work? Well, what is lambda? If you solve for lambda, that's plus minus i. It's a complex eigenvalue, but a complex eigenvalue with zero real part. So you shouldn't have, if lambda is real, you shouldn't have a zero real eigenvalue. If it's complex, you shouldn't have zero real part. So in the exam, if you have an example like this, you should stop and just mention that linearization uh, is not applicable. So
So you will see actually from the plotter that this is actually a stable spiral. It's a stable point. <coughs> but again, mathematically, you cannot tell that based on the uh, plotter. And in fact, many of the plotters uh, based on the Jacobian. And many of the plotters actually will give you misleading information. You'll see actually at some point the graph seems to stop and it's not clear whether it's because you reach a stable point or maybe because you're done with the steps of integration because behind the plotter is a numerical algorithm. So that numerical algorithm has a finite number of iterations and at some point the number of iterations is exhausted and you know there's no conclusion to be made from the graph itself. That's why it's very important as with everything in math it's extremely important to know the theory behind it. I mean, if I were to give you an advice, I give it to the students most of the time, not just in this class, you know. The machines is useful. Uh, it may replace 99% of what you do on paper, but your brain should still be guardian of the machine because, you know, uh, if you don't know the theory behind it, you will be fooled by the machine. It's just as simple as that. I mean, so you have to uh, be aware when it's possible that um, the computer doesn't give you the, the correct answer. Uh, so from this point on, what I'm going to say now is optional for this class. Um, I want to give you a quick, because it's kind of actually funny, you know, I mean, how do you actually come up with these examples um, for that to happen, right? I mean, when you have these inconclusive situations and then you still want to know actually how the behavior looks like. Most of these examples actually are concocted for textbook purposes, right? I mean, they are actually uh, concocted so that you have a certain behavior. And in the two by two case, many of these uh, tricky examples, not only this one, but some other even trickier ones, um, can be actually concocted from the polar coordinates. So you actually start with a polar coordinate system that has a certain behavior, and then you move it back to the X and Y coordinates, and there you go, you have your um, example that has that property. So uh, the polar coordinates part is not covered in this class, right? I mean, it's not necessary, but um, if you want to know how this looks like in polar coordinates, um, you could change this. Um, so the polar coordinates are r cosine of theta, r sine of theta. And uh, uh, you know, remember, if, if, if uh, just, to, just to refresh the memory, right? So r is the polar radius, the distance from the origin to the point theta is the polar angle, right? Um, so I'm not going to re rewrite the full system in R and theta. I just want to point out what the equation of R looks like. So if you have a differential system in x of t, y of t, you could change it via this uh, transformation into a differential system in R of t, t, theta of t. So as x and y changes, of course, you may assume that the radius changes and theta changes in time. Um, furthermore, remember there is a relationship between uh, x, y, and r given by Pythagorean theorem, right? So r squared is going to be x squared plus y squared, but uh, that involves cosine squared plus sine squared, which is equal to 1. So the way I wrote this system here, you can change it quickly. You can get the equation in r by simply differentiating this equality and replacing um, x prime and y prime with these expressions. So take a look at this. If I differentiate both sides, on the left we have 2 times r, r prime. Um, and on the right hand side, 2x, x prime, because of the chain rule, right? 2y, y prime. Um, you can cancel the 2 and r times r prime is x times x prime will be this. So I'm going to use this expression here because I can replace x squared plus y squared with r squared. So here it's going to be y minus x times r squared. Um, and then plus um, y times the second equation, y prime, which is minus x minus y times r squared. Right, so x squared plus y squared is r squared. So this example is concocted so that you could rewrite the whole thing in terms of r, because you have some cancellation here. So x, y minus x squared r squared minus x, y minus y squared r squared. <coughs> x, y cancels. Then you can pull out minus r squared. 
Again, you may wonder how come it works so nicely. Again, because it's worked out back way, ba ba uh, you know, backwards. Actually, it's it's concocted from the polar coordinates and back to the to the co Cartesian coordinates. So it's no magic here. And this is r squared, and therefore this is minus r fourth. You can cancel r, assuming it's not zero. So r prime is minus r third. Okay. So basically, this example is so that the equation in the polar radius is this. Uh, we can look at the equation in theta, but we're, we're not going to go over that. I just want to point out that this is how you can tell that, in fact, the radius goes to 0 in time. So I mean, eventually, the solution will approach 0, 0. It's just that that cannot be inferred from the Jacobian. Uh, again, this, this is an optional part. Don't, I don't want to, to get uh, uh, confused for the purposes of, of this class and the final exam. So for the purposes of the final exam, if you have a zero eigenvalue or a zero real part, just uh, show that you are aware of that situation and, and say that the, um, the Jacobian is not applicable in that case. Uh, but that, that I put this here because that's not to say we surrender, right? I mean, there are other techniques um, to figure out the stability. It's just that that's not part of the scope of this class when the eigenvalue is zero. Those are borderline cases which are usually more complex to deal with. So I hope you enjoyed the class. This is the last lesson. I'm going to finish up. Don't forget, we're going to run some examples. Um, so there will be a Camtasia part after this for some of the examples in this, in this class. And I'm going to end up with uh, some conclusions.